Good afternoon. My name is Masako Mazwamuse. I'm the CEO of the Southern Africa Trust. Welcome to Society Talks, season two of Society Talks, a platform where we amplify the voice of marginalized communities in Southern Africa. And uh, we bring topics that are of interest, issues that are of concern to the citizens of the region and to encourage public dialogue like, around some of these common, common concerns. Today, we will be talking about, we'll be looking at SADC's response in times of multiple crisis and peace building. And we're having this discussion in the context of, um, uh, in, 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 the, in the context of, um, crisis uh, that is unfolding in Mozambique, uh, particularly in northern part of Mozambique in uh, Capo de Galdo province in the northern part of Mozambique. And it has been described using so many words depending on who is framing the problem and who is talking about the, the, the issues that are at play. Some have said, this is a question of Islamic insurgency. Others have said it's a resource driven war that is taking place there. And others have said it is a, a, question, a question of failed uh, governance, but that the crisis gets worse with every day that passes, thousands and thousands of communities are affected. And there's been questions around the extent to which SADC as an intergovernmental body has been able to respond or, or not. So we've got, we've organized today's session in two parts. We will start with, um, with a, a music uh, performance from Sounds of the South and then follow it up with a panel discussion uh, where we've invited three experts uh, from the field to share with us their perspectives and to help us unpack and come to a better understanding of what the question at play is. Ultimately, the bigger question that we are asking is, are we going to be able to see an integrated region that is able to address the questions of poverty and inequality, as well as economic growth, if we continue to fail to address um, um, uh, security concerns that are unfolding in different parts of our region. While today we can talk about Mozambique, we know that uh, the DRC has faced challenges over the years, um, Angola every now and then, and Zimbabwe has been in a state of crisis for, for quite a while. And so this is not just about Mozambique, it is really around um, uh, whether we, we, we can realize peace in our region and whether peace can translate to development for, for us all. Um, I will pause there and invite Sons of the South to share their performance with us and then pick up from, from then on. Over to you, Sons of the South. Really? Yeah. Um... Uh, greetings, everybody. Uh, we are Sounds of the South. Uh, we are very much happy to be here. Sounds of the South is a political hip hop collective based in Cape Town, South Africa. We create materials of awakening in the fight against capitalist and patriarchal uh, exploitations. Um, the song that we're about to do today is called Black Bodies, which highlights the experiences of um, working class communities in the region in the face of um, oppression and um, state violence. Keep that will shoot you 
those you Chu <laughs> Fuck the stress, we, we keep, keep resisting. resisting. Break the chain of capitalism. Face to Uh, 
gun blazing Tears running down these brown faces This is my home, I can't shake it If the spraying just the plague is spreading with quickness This is restless, night is sleepless They killed the seamstress All for political interest Ethnolinguistic divisions She was a young lady from the Eastern Cape Came to Deben looking for a job and a place to stay Back in the days of apartheid Moved in the hostel 1992 The same year they gunned down Don Wellington Over ethnic size and factionalized party politics Fast forward 1994 we have a black president But nothing really changed for the residents of Cleveland in Tungo Nena Comtel, Bokutas Fishomet, or Funu Perfum, Lamzoba, Kukus Fishlang, a Chor, Luvelling, a Panda, Wonkum Gola, Gonga, Linkoka, Bakuku, Perfum, Nongo, Bukulen, or Munon. Oh no, oh no, Tenunga to Quaseka, Yum Conto. Oh no, oh no, Tenunga to Quaseka, Yum Conto. Zulu, yes, Zulu. Lengo tagalo, la chone mini langa, so kaula maja tanga, kutete ubo nyama, kuvele ugu kanya nzulu, yesi manga nzulu. Lengo tagalo, la chone mini langa, so kaula maja tanga, Kutete ugu nyama, kufele ugu kanya To hell with the RDP, the BEE, the RET All I wanna see is my people free Be the change we seek to see Nowadays it ain't safe to sleep Police arm in the streets Sending our homes into prisons Preventing us from fighting against land thieves They're using fear to silence we Keeping us trapped in the belly of the beast They're raping and killing mother nature Are we in danger? This is our home but we treat it like strangers We're not waiting on God and the angels to save us it's it's only fair we take a stand and rise and defend ourselves Protecting our children's legacy It's a fight to the death till we break free from the chains Till we break free from the chains Till we break free from the chains One Baza beki lana bes tembile be yimbumbu tela bezo spiti geza Ha! Two Basulanga magoba ma pepe no siba bati ma siki kijele baso siza Three Bastolela mas babo tele baso lugi suktala non pagati baya siza Four Bapuma ba pele me fene basangi ba pinde babu ye beso spushisa It's a struggle, a struggle, 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 We go thirsty for days, si sebu kwa yibeni, si sele mkopo zweni, ya mkopo zweni Hongale ntoko babu ya bas tanta teki, se bas nungu teki, se bas koman ya minwe hypersentain The community rise fighting for equality, this is reality Inga iba lendao, batupele mkosi, bas koko nga bas koman ya mkone gati Ewe kalo kule tili vana yinga katlo yinkrizi, ya kala si kwanti Zulu Yes, manga Zulu Lengo tagalo La chone mini langa So paula magia tanga Kutete ugu mnyama Kuvele ugu kanya Zulu Yes, manga Zulu Lengo tagalo La chone mini langa So kaula maja tanga Kutete ugu mnyama Kuvele ugu kanya Bangati benza malinge Oso nula kwenkwa lep Basikia shela malunge No bastembi singulu lep Bastembi sana nge kosho kriba batu kuno mpe Pepa daba la kroka kipali story style utep Bezi ngoli kole no singa bonu bastineze Ezi bosi sa nyondo asi papeze politician Tine zanza sa kondo asi manes mungwele kukwele Spale nesele no mocha ketu wula wego we Kukuli kulu umombi ya kosha ngo keli za mocha Da kroka no vota ni pilu kwa boka Bastate ni songa bazenza makoka si tipa yokoza 
Break free from the chains. Well, break free from the chains. Break free from the chains. Well, break free from the chains. Um, yeah, thank you so much uh, for having us. Um, we honor this moment. Um, you can also find our songs on um, digital platforms like YouTube, um, Spotify, iTunes. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you, thank you, guys. You actually made my job easy. I was wondering as you were performing where people can find your music. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Sounds of the South. And I think I should uh, let you know that Sounds of the South Collective is a political hip hop. So their music is more than just hip hop. It's hip hop with a purpose hip hop with, with a very important message. It's a pity that first song, Black Bodies, that you performed uh, had uh, some glitches. I hope that we can bring you back later and have a retake of, of that song. But what, what Sounds of the South Collective tries to do with hip hop is to build an international working class counterculture that is anti-authoritarian, anti-capitalist, anti-racist, and anti-sexist. And uh, their music is so relevant and their performance today is so relevant when we're looking to have a nuanced understanding of the causes of conflict, that sometimes they're a lot more layered than what we are led to believe. And going back to what I was saying in my introductory remarks, where I was talking about how this has been framed as an Islamic, uh, Islamist uh, insurgency and sometimes a resource-driven war or a failure of governance perhaps does not uh, unpack the problem to an extent that we need in order for us to have real honest discussions around how we're going to build peace and security in the Southern Africa region and how indeed we, con we connect peace and security with the citizens' rights to development and the rights to live a life that is free of poverty and inequality. As I said, I've got three very well-versed experts who are going to be joining us today. I am going to go around and introduce them. I ask that you switch on your cameras so that when I introduce you, you can wave to our participants and they know and they can put a face to the name. Um, we've got Dr. Boa Monjani and Boa Monjani is a scholar activist from Mozambique. He holds a PhD on post-colonialisms post and global citizenship from the Faculty of uh, Economics at the University of Coimbra. I'm probably going to get that right, uh, wrong and uh, uh, Boa can, can, can correct me there. He's based at the Institute for Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies at the University of Western Cape as a postdoctoral researcher and is also a fellow of the International Research Group on Authoritarianism and Counter Strategies at the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung in, in Germany. And that's where you are at at the moment, right, Boa? That's right. If you could wave and, and people can see who Boa is. We are also joined by uh, Liesel Lovaldron. Liesel, I had to practice how to, how to pronounce your surname and you'll uh, correct me if I got that wrong. Liesel is a senior researcher at the Institute for Security Studies. She's the editor of the ISS monthly publication on the African Union Peace and Security Council, uh, the PSC report, I'm not sure what PSC means, and the ISS project leader for Southern Africa. She, is, she has worked in many countries in Africa over the past 25 years and has written two books and several research projects on African issues. She's also been one of those people who are quite prominent in, in, the, in media, in print media, uh, writing about the conflict that is taking place in, in Mozambique at, at the moment. 
our third participant is Dr. Michael Charles. He's a seasoned diplomat and an international development professional with more over 18 years experience in providing technical managerial and, and operational support to field and country offices of the Red Cross, as well as in public and the private sector. Dr. Charles has engaged with government authorities at various levels in over 30 countries. So if there's anybody who's going to paint the picture for us on how we get peace to gain traction within government spaces, uh, this is uh, we, we, uh, the person to, to bring us into that confidence. He is currently the head of International Federation at the Red Cross and Red Cross Crescent Country Cluster Office for Southern Africa based in Pretoria. Welcome, Charles. Welcome, Boa, and welcome, uh, Lizel. Boa, we're going to start with you. And uh, the question to you is really simple. And it's for you to paint the picture for us in terms of what is happening in northern Mozambique, what is happening in Cabo de, Gal de, de Galdo province, and what are the causes of the conflict in your perspective? and what you are hearing from citizens on the ground. Right, thank you, Masehu. Um, I'm very happy to be in this important talk. Well, uh, as you all know, um, an insurgent movement emerged in Cabo Delgado, in northern Mozambique, uh, and it's led by a group, a group locally uh, called uh, Al-Shabaab or referred to as Al-Shabaab. At the beginning, the group was attacking government buildings and police stations, uh, probably to confiscate weapons. Um, but uh, later, the group started to target civilians and occupy entire towns or villages. Um, as we speak now, it's ex uh, estimated that some, I mean, around uh, or close to 3,000 people have been killed and more than uh, seven. 700,000 people have been displaced from their homes and, and from their, uh, you know, districts. Um, and, but what caught the attention of the world was an attack in March uh, this year in which the insurgents uh, uh, targeted Palma, where a large project for, for the extraction of, of gas is being developed mainly by a French multinational oil company, Total. Uh, and in fact, only because that attack on March 24th, um, um, that led to death of some or several um, foreigners uh, working with uh, oil industry and related service there, uh, only, only then uh, did SADC leadership met uh, in April uh, to plot what appears to be mainly a military response, right? Um, I might say later what is my position and our position as, as civil society in Mozambique about that. So what is happening in Cabo Delgado, uh, I argue, is uh, a, a natural resource conflict that is um, precipitated by the discovering and concessioning of gas deposits to multinational companies by, uh, by my government, with, of course, a complicit local elite uh, lacking due regard for the human rights, develop, the development, uh, develop, 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 develop local development, um, as well as, you know, like environmental and, and, and climate impacts on local communities. So, so this is extractivism and has a norm extractivism leads to genocide, inequality, insurgency, and violence. So Cap Delgado is not something new to the world. We know uh, uh, situations similar uh, around, around the global south. What worries us uh, now is that um, is, the, is the SADC plan to further militarize Cap Delgado. Um, and we think that the, the SADC military intervention may well further escalate the conflict in Cap Delgado, but only uh, uh, but not only in Cap Delgado, uh, as well as across across the region. Uh, Masejo, I will leave it there for now, and I will be happy to intervene or interject uh, as the conversation evolves. 
Thanks, thanks, Boa, because I, I do have a follow up question for you to think about when we come back is the, the critique that you have for the SADC response that you're saying it's further militarization. The question I have for you is at this point, what are the alternatives that SADC has in order to contain the situation? Um, and what would would be an immediate in an immediate response? And perhaps uh, Lizelle can also build on that. Lizelle, you, from your writing, you have boiled this down to a governance challenge, and you have tied this to some of the allegations that emerge around uh, deeply extended corruption um, uh, in Mozambique. Um, oh, and I would imagine that this is not just to to corruption in Mozambique. Uh, just hold on, we've got a guest who's joined and they were not muted. Sorry about that. Yeah, but my, 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 yeah, my question to you is uh, to help us in further unpacking the context and uh, just elaborating a bit more on some of the analysis that you've been sharing um, in, in, the, in the media. Lizelle? Sure. Um, yes, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me. I've been um, following the society talks and, and it's a wonderful opportunity to engage with, with many people around the region. So um, basically, um, as, as, as Boa said, the previous speaker, you know, this, uh, the region, I think I've been very, very concerned around 2019, 2020, especially when the crisis really escalated dramatically. And then, as he said, this big attack uh, on the 25th of March in Palma. Um, and it's unfortunate that it took such a long time actually for the media and especially the media, for example, in South Africa and in, in, uh, on the continent to really take note because we know that our politicians and, you know, are often, only responding when uh, when a crisis is already um, escalated and and when the media really takes note and so um, we are we are sitting with with a huge crisis and it's it's the first time that Sadek really is confronted with this kind of threat like violent extremism um, so so um, can you is it fine can you hear me okay Yes, we can hear you fine. Please, please continue. Yeah, sure. Uh, yes, so I think the, the region really, SADC as an institution and our regional member states are in disarray really about what to do, including the Mozambican government that have been struggling from first responding uh, through the police and then uh, the, the military that, that is very weak and and. So, so uh, as the Institute for Security Studies, we've been following it and uh, doing research since uh, around about the end of 2017 when the first attack started. And our sense has always been that um, it, it is at the root causes of this conflict is really a toxic mix of, of various issues, notably, as Boa said, the um, resource curse, the pre-resource curse in this case, because we still haven't seen the LNG come online. And uh, there have been some money that flowed from the uh, when Total bought these, um, some of the stakes from the American company, Anadarka was there, but we, the other, um, LNG uh, projects have still, you know, it's 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 still being built and the infrastructure is still being built. But many other issues um, of radicalization, of um, uh, the link with corruption and uh, the illicit trade as well in that region, that makes it very complicated. And then also the um, role, you know, and the connection with Tanzania, Kenya, the region. I mean, we can't um, just look at this crisis in Cabo Delgado in complete uh, isolation. So, so, so what we've said is because it's so complex and multifaceted and what we've seen in the rest of Africa is that, um, you know, uh, military responses on their own have never ended any terror threat around the world and in Africa. And we have so many lessons that we can learn from what's happening in places like the Sahel, the Lake Chad Basin with Boko Haram, where literally 10 years down the line, people are now saying, 
oh, look at livelihoods, look at dialogue, look at communities, uh, uh, look at development, where the immediate response was, you know, when the crisis broke out in Mali in 2012, when the Boko Haram crisis, you know, that started in 2009, but then escalated, the, the, the immediate response was just to send a military force. And, and so we have those lessons to learn. But what needs to, so I'll just end off by three points. What needs to be done immediately? We do think um, something drastically must be done to save lives, to, to protect the victims to uh, um, um, protect them and give them humanitarian aid. And of course the ICRC and everybody is there, uh, um, you know, already, but it's the responsibility ultimately of the Mozambican government. And then whichever um, SADC intervention comes to protect people, in those the scenes that we are seeing on a daily basis, people, you know, in little um, boats trying to escape violence uh, because the roads have, you know, been completely unsafe, uh, you know, and then some of them drowning and escaping to islands and then being attacked. It really is uh, absolutely heartbreaking. So the immediate thing is for them. And then I think for the Sadek region and on that other on that level to understand exactly what's going on. Who are these perpetrators? Who are these attackers? Because as I was three years down the line, you know, we've all the best minds have been writing and researching. We still really don't understand exactly who are funding the insurgents. Are they really linked to Islamic State um, as the propaganda shows as some of their own uh, statements show, as the Americans have now told us, they've officially designated the crisis as ISIS Mozambique, like designated these attackers. So that's what needs to happen is intelligence. And there you can't do that just on your own. The region needs to help. And of course, if the Americans and the Portuguese and the French, that's a whole other webinar that we can have about the, what the non-African responses, but at least they can help, you know, if they are willing to share intelligence so that we can better understand because without really understanding who, who these perpetrators are, how are we going to actually contain the threat, make sure people are safe, make sure the economic development continues because now look, uh, um, Total and so on are withdrawn. We are, we, we are looking at the worst case scenario, uh, which I think is, is pretty likely now is that all this amazing $60 billion of liquid natural gas off the coast of Mozambique, a promise of the biggest investment we've ever seen on the African continent, is now going to go offshore. It's going to be, um, there's already one huge um, um, container ship that I saw being built in South Korea that will be in the sea. The liquid natural gas will be shipped to Japan, Europe, etc. Mozambique and the region will get zero benefit, not in terms of jobs, not in terms of um, infrastructure that's going to be built, not in definitely not in terms of liquid natural gas that might come to us. So, um, you know, on, on, on the short term, security must be uh, restored, development must happen, we must, we must make sure that the long term education and, um, you know, po poverty alleviation and, and issues like that. So I can, I can um, complete later on, perhaps, uh, in terms of questions and so on about why, you know, the weaknesses of SADC and why we need a better SADC, ultimately, a better institution to not only here in Mozambique, as you said in the beginning, but you know, this terror, these terror threats and violent extremism, but also all kinds of other threats are unpredictable. You know, you don't know who's going to be the next target. And um, it's, it's absolutely, you know, not an easy um, issue to grapple with. So we need to get SADC and the member states and need our structures to improve. Otherwise, you know, we will we'll still be grappling with this like decades uh, down the line. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Lizelle. I think what you've done is just to bring out the, the layers of complexity uh, that I at play here. I mean, Boa was talking about linking this with uh, extract, extractivism, and you are bringing in the, the issue of energy wars and uh, the sponsors of, of, of those wars. And uh, 
how sometimes even the non-African, in most cases, the non-African response is not necessarily a neutral response. And there's this jostle to, con to, to, you know, to, to control the narrative around what the root causes are and uh, especially what the response ought to be. Uh, the point that you make about military responses uh, on their own not being adequate, I think is an important one. And a good uh, segue to bring in uh, Dr. Charles. And Dr. Charles, the northern part of Mozambique is, is one place where the Red Cross has had a long-term presence. And um, it'd be great for you to help us paint the picture just in terms of what the impacts of this kind of conflict has on the ground and the additional burden that it, it puts on agencies like yourselves, just in terms of humanitarian response, but also your efforts to build long-term community resilience. Um, could you just share your, your, your insights on uh, what you are seeing on the ground and uh, the risks that the civil unrest in Northern Mozambique presents for, for communities? Over to you, Charles. Thank, thank you very much, Maseho, and you know, thanks for inviting me to this discussion. Um, very, very pertinent indeed in terms of what's going on and the humanitarian situation. Whether we take um, Capo Delgado or we look into South Sudan, Central Africa Republic, um, Northeast Nigeria, the consequences on humanitarian work is basically the same. You know, what we see is families being torn apart. These are communities that are already vulnerable. If we look at you know, the last two years with Cyclone Idai happening, with Cyclone Kenneth happening, now we have Cyclone Shalan and Eloise, and those consequences of communities not being able to recover fully, and then on top of that, there's further crisis. Um, if I take the example of Capo Delgado, as, um, as Boa said, 700,000 people have fled the province in the last three years. These are 700,000 people, not in terms of numbers, but actual human beings going to other areas that are already suffering vulnerability. So they go into communities that are trying to cope <laughs> from multiple disasters, and then there's other influx of, of additional people. I mean, what we see there in terms of what is on the ground is issues around gender-based violence. We know with um, insurrections, with insurgencies, with conflicts, comes a lot of gender-based violence, which we're seeing in the communities. I'll give you an example of a colleague when, we went, when I was living in, in South Sudan, and he told me some of his effects of the conflict that he actually spent over 20 years between primary school and secondary school just because every now and then he has to move um, cities, he has to you know, go into the bush and he's not able to get proper education. If we look at Northeast Nigeria where there are kidnappings almost on a daily basis of children that are being recruited into, into, the, into, the, um, into the force. Um, so a, a lot of issues happen when, when we look into conflict as well as humanitarian um, action. Other examples are issues around education. We all know that education is really, really important. And if children are not able to go to school because they are fleeing, then there's an issue for the next generation if we're not able to have, have them educated. Another example is, you know, it's, it's happened in front of my eyes and not in Cabo Delgado, but in a different area where, you know, a woman was torn away from her children. You know, there were two children and she had to choose between which one to grab and go with and which one to leave behind. And these are real stories where families are being torn apart and where we as the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement have to come in and support them in terms of reunification of family links, in terms of just providing the basic amenities. And when we talk to the villagers, when we talk to the community members, basically they want the same thing as myself and we also want Maseko which is you know, food, shelter, a decent living, and to be respected with dignity and to really be able to cater for their family. You know, what we see within conflict is that this is not certain. And you know, a lot, a lot of, lot of you know, efforts that we're making 
is really around how do we provide shelter for these people, make sure that we're able to provide food, make sure we're able to send you know, the children to, to, to school. So basically, you know, we, we, we are really on the ground with our volunteers as the Red Cross Red Crescent movement in terms of crisis, um, but also in terms of natural disasters. And on top of the natural disasters, um, as I said, you know, people are already vulnerable and then comes the conflict as well. So it's definitely not an easy situation that we're seeing in Cabo Delgado, um, but it's a situation that we're saying, let's come together and let's really try to build back better and make sure that we're able to build the resilience of the communities. But as long as the crisis continues, it becomes much, much harder. And you know, what we've learned from other regions as has been said by uh, my previous speakers is, if this is not contained um, at an early stage, it's going to have a snowball effect to other countries, to other regions and to the whole of, of the continent. And you know, I've seen that in Northeast Nigeria, We've seen that in South Sudan, where communities, more and more communities were affected um, just because it wasn't contained. Um, so, so really there's a lot for us to do as humanitarian actors, but also as academia to really see how we can come and support Sadat's efforts in terms of controlling the, the, um, the, the, the conflict in, in Cabo Delgado. So I'll stop here um, and look forward to follow up um, interactions. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Charles, for that sobering reminder that uh, behind the numbers that uh, get thrown around is people, is that Sounds of the South said, black bodies, it's children, it's mothers, it's communities that are fighting for their survival. And uh, you remind us as well that um, the, the, the global as well as the regional attention on this issue is urgent, but most importantly, that some of the relief and the support that is required is immediate while we're seeking to understand what the causes of this problem, what the causes of this problem is. I think you make an important point around why there's a need for solidarity and also why such a dialogue like this is important at this time, is this is not a problem for Mozambique and Mozambique alone. The point you make about the snowball effect and the impact that the, the conflict is in Mozambique potentially has for uh, neighboring countries in the region is, is, a, is a wake up call for, for us all. Um, I'd love to invite uh, participants and, 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 and our, our friends who are online to please just uh, jot your questions and comments on the chat box so we can make this as interactive as possible. But at this point, um, Boa, uh, uh, th this might be a good place where you can come in around the question, how do we support SADC? Uh, recently, the Southern Africa People's Solidarity Network convened around this, re th this question. So the question is, what does SADC need to do? But most importantly, how do we as citizens um, support SADC in resolving uh, the, 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 the conflict in, in Mozambique at the moment? Boa? You, you are mute, comrade. Yes, sorry. I never learned how, how this works. <laughs> I think the Southern Africa People Solidarity Network, uh, a, net, a network of uh, social movements, civil society and activists around the region that, by the way, was born uh, more than a decade ago. It's not, it was not born as a result of uh, Cabo Delgado, um, has a very clear position. And our clear position is that um, the, the whatever solution SADC puts forward should be people-centered. We believe that what SADC is uh, worried about or is preoccupied about is to protect um, the interest of, of, of capital. Uh, this means to, to protect uh, the interest of multinational corporations, to make sure that uh, gas is actually extracted. We say that um, if, if the intervention is to, to do that, then uh, it's not sustainable. I think we sh it should be people-centered. It should be based on solidarity. And we think that um, not only the military intervention is sufficient, but we don't believe that it's not um, suitable, right? As a measure. And that, um, you know, 
we, 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 we think that in fact, condition, the preconditions for insurgency to exist in Northern Mozambique um, were there for so long time. The problem of, of poverty and inequality and, and dispossession in Cap Delgado were there before the insurgency. So what does it mean? It means that we, we, we have to resolve those problems. And I think Sadek, Sadek elites, including people living in South Africa and other countries of, of Sadek, should probably think of other measures such as, for instance, paying, I don't know, climate debt, right? Because, you know, they pollute the <laughs> uh, 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 Sadek region. This, that, this must sound bizarre, but that's true. I mean, there is a collective responsibility here uh, that created preconditions for situations such as Cap Delgado to exist. But I wanted to react a bit about what uh, Liz said about you know, the government not knowing what to do and the lack of intelligence. I, 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 I don't think uh, I, 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 I fully agree. I read today um, in the newsletter, the Mozambique newsletter, uh, that the president of Tanzania said, you know, she does not, she doesn't want to send a uh, military uh, intervention to Cap Delgado. She says we should negotiate with terrorists. That indicates that they have a clue of what is going on and who is involved. And I'm, I'm sure that my president, Nusi, knows what is going on in Cabo Delgado. And for that matter, I think there are other solutions than military intervention. Should I continue, Marcia? I can stop. <laughs> I have a lot to say. Okay. Okay. Uh, you can stop there, and 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 maybe uh, uh, Lizelle can also come in here on the same question, and also to comment on what you've just said about this perceived lack of knowledge on the and lack lack of intelligence on the part part of Mozambique, and you are you are challenging that that perspective, right, um, Lizelle? Over to you. Yes, thank you. Um, this is a very interesting debate that is raging amongst, you know, um, people on the ground, specialists, uh, um, you know, commentators and so on about whether um, Mozambique knows but just doesn't want to say because it's involved in so many illicit activities there and that in fact one of the main reasons that it uh, president new sea and and mozambique doesn't want a sadek force there is because then there will be scrutiny of what is exactly going on and all and the trafficking and so on so i mean that is one theory but um i do think um there is there are various narratives. Sorry. Sorry. Can you... Yes, yes, please, please continue. I'm just uh, okay. trying to get something from the technical team. <laughs> okay. Forgive me. Sure. Um, there are they are conflicting narratives. I mean, um, you know, we since we are all speaking about the Pan-African Parliament, um, I spoke as a session of the Southern African Caucus of the Pan-African Parliament about three weeks ago, um, which was quite rare, actually, because the African Union itself has not met or discussed uh, Cabo Delgado. The Mozambican government came and presented its case uh, to parliamentarians there now. And I also spoke and another colleague, um, and it was so uh, clear and uh, there was a, it was radically um, uh, opposing views because the narrative of the uh, Mozambican government, or at least, you know, because it also depends on who you speak to at what time. And I'm not even saying that the Mozambican government itself is vehicling the same narrative, but it was completely and almost entirely focused on um, the extremist radical Islamic state threat coming from outside you know, um, and and so almost um, taking away that responsibility and the root causes we've been talking about and marginalization and so on. So the MPs that are there with SADC member states um, hear this and make decisions based on that specific narrative, uh, you know. So who controls the narrative as well? Um, as I said, the United States um, who is a big player all around and you know, is training now troops in Mozambique. 
has got a certain narrative. Others, as you mentioned, Tanzania. It's interesting because Tanzania has been quite effective, even under Magufuli, um, of, of containing threats, uh, violent extremism coming, you know, is, is along, along East Africa. It's not as if it's only uh, in Cabo Delgado. In fact, I mean, we know uh, threats in, in, in Somalia, but, but in Kenya and, um, and Tanzania as well. They also uh, obviously know extremely well how to do counterterrorism. Um, so, uh, and, they are, uh, and Tanzania is a key uh, player, I would say, in this. Tanzania is a member of SADC, even though it's a member of the EIC, and you know, sometimes with one foot in East Africa and one in Southern Africa. Um, I, I honestly think it, the important thing is um, if we had like, for example, in the Lake Chad base in Northeastern um, Nigeria, um, an identified threat or a group, or, you know, um, everybody can agree on what's going on. Um, it would make the responses not easier because, as you know, it's unpredictable and these groups move around and break up and some are with Al-Qaeda and some with ISIS. But at least then you would, you would prevent, like, as I said, this complete disconnect and um, disagreement. Uh, and then you can't have a government that comes and says, oh, actually, it's got nothing to do with this. It's, an, it's a threat that comes from outside. And intelligence, well-meaning intelligence, I do think is, is something that SADC can contribute. Mm, mm. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I think yeah, uh, uh, there's a point of convergence there uh, between you and, 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 and Bora to, to some extent um, around the, uh, you know, the point that you are making that the, the root causes are not purely all external to what you were saying about the preconditions for conflict existing because there are problems that have remained unresolved over, over many years. And this, uh, the causes of poverty and, and inequality um, being one of those uh, biggest issues that actually uh, provides uh, the conditions for, for conflict to, to, to thrive. Um, and, and coming to you, um, uh, Charles, I think, uh, in, in the immediate, the, the humanitarian response is the thing to do. But from your um, insights, what needs to be done in the long term to actually put an end to, 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 to uh, us needing to co co constantly uh, uh, react in the way that we, we, we must be in a position where we are forced to mobilize aid and mobilize charity as a response to to, to conflict um, in the communities. You were talking about the support that, that SADC needs. There is that immediate support, but in the long term, what kind of support does SADC need in order to avoid um, conflicts like this uh, happening in, in the region? Yeah, so thanks, thanks very much. Um, and allow me just to give you a few reflections and examples of you know, some of the experience I have. You know, it really saddens me when I see again, in a place like South Sudan, where, you know, there's just so much fertile ground and you see that, you know, farmers could harvest if there was peace. Um, and you see trucks and trucks and trucks of food just being taken to communities because they're not able to, you know, plow the land and, and, and harvest the field because of the conflict. Um, and it brings me back to the point to say, you know, what can we do on the longer run? You know, inequality is just there, and that could be one of the drivers of, of conflict. Um, poverty also could be one of the drivers of conflict. Unemployment, um, I think, is a huge driver of conflict. So what are we doing as the Red Cross is, you know, we're trying to, as much as possible, give back to the communities, try to have youth engagement strategies where we are able to take the youth away from the from the from the roads and then empower them with something technical in terms of you know, some, some, some technical employment where they can learn skills. Um, the other thing is we know, you know when we look into agriculture, 
um, and food insecurity, we know 70% of farmers are smallholder farmers. So again, we're trying to empower them on a much longer run in terms of being able to produce and generate food for themselves, able to produce enough so that they have enough money and capital to be able to do what they want in terms of businesses and sending their kids to school. So I think for me, in terms of what should SADAC do is, again, we need to look at this holistically. Um, you know, look at employment, look at, look at the youth, how do we keep them engaged? Look at issues around education, look at issues around infrastructure, because again, trying to bargain and trying to sell things across borders, you know, look at the, you know, the free trade zone, you know, look at so many things that will create employment and that will, you know, ensure that, you know, radicalization and then co-opting the younger ones into, into these um, groups um, will be minimal. Um, so for us, it's really more of a longer term approach. You know, but I, I beg to ask the question, um, and maybe to my fellow colleagues, is that, you know, is there a political will to end this? And I think for me, that's the critical first question. Is there a political will, both from the government, but also from, you know, from the, from the regional economic communities, from the African Union? And if so, how do we, how do we mobilize um, so that we can really ensure that that political will is translated into action on the ground. Over to you. Mm. Thank you, thank you, Charles. That's a pertinent question. Is there political will to end this crisis? Um, and, and a question for, for, for your fellow uh, panelists. I'd like to open up uh, for questions from uh, participants uh, on, on, on Zoom. Uh, if you want to pose a question, please feel free to to jump in at this at this point, um, I'll take uh, four questions for our panelists and and take it back to them uh, as we wrap up. Yeah, I will. And anyone want to uh, brave enough to be the first one to speak up and 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 ask a question or share their own insights? Maybe I can I'd like to ask a question. Sure. Uh, Thank you very much. It's interesting conversation we are having, and I believe we we really need to be engaging on on, on such important topics topics of discussion. Uh, it's one thing to actually uh, you know talk about the many issues that are actually affecting Southern Africa, uh, literally the whole entire African region, but it's yet another thing to see how best we can bring this amazing and profound submission, um, you know, and profound submission actually uh, to 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 practical uh, uh, I think my question is uh, how do we engage young people at such at that level you know uh, because one of the things that I'd love to state is that if we don't engage young people at that particular level when we talk about issues of peace conflict and security issues we're going to be finding a situation where history begins to repeat itself because young people are actually the future leaders and not practically the future leaders, but they are the leaders even of today, tomorrow and the years to come. So my question is how then can we rightly engage young people at that level where we ensure that when we talk about issues of peace and security and conflict resolution, even young people truly get to see that indeed they have a fair share in what it is that we're actually talking about right now. So my focus right now is how do we engage young people, taking into consideration that Africa is purely a young, a young, uh, a young continent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mula. I think that's a pertinent question, especially given what uh, Dr. Charles said uh, uh, around uh, the long-term solutions, and one of those being to resolve the question of unemployment for young people. And if we're going to be having conversations about avoiding conflicts in future, uh, that question that you ask is an important one. Um, uh, Andronicus, uh, and then I will have Obert, and I will read the questions that I have on the chat and uh, 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 throw it back to the panelists. And uh, Andronicus, you've got the floor and uh, please correct me if I got your name wrong. You, you might be on mute, we can't hear you. 
Okay, while we, we hello, sort hello. that out. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, my name is Berita Saranji, representing uh, Family Vision Child Trust under, family, under Obed Gonzo. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Uh, would okay. love to see your face. Uh, we see President Nangagwa behind you. <laughs> but please carry on. <laughs> Are you are you serious? Oh, can you see me now? Hey, hello. Can you see me now? Ah, can you see me now like this? Yes, now we can see you. Please carry on. Okay, okay. Uh, mine is not really a question, but uh, I just want to contribute, uh, especially on um, the disabled, the disabled people, not the disabled, but the physically challenged people in our community. These people mainly, they are not uh, formally employed because normally by the society's prejudice on them, uh, at times that they don't finish school and they start to look for peace works. And in this uh, peace works, they are mostly abused. I'm talking here about gender-based violence. Hello. Mm -hmm. uh, on gender-based violence, these people are easily uh, abused. Uh, we have got many cases of these women who come to our organization to report their, that they have been abused. Some of them are not paid. As we speak right now, today we received, uh, a, I, I mean, uh, okay. yes, there were three, right? Yes. There were, yes, three cases of these women who came and say, uh, they were abused wherever they went for work. The other one is, is deaf and dumb. It's so sad. Uh, we don't know as, uh, uh, yes, as sad and as how can we help these people? It's so sad. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Thank you so much uh, uh, for, 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 for that question. And I think you are bringing in... Um, uh, a, a population that we, we did not touch on. Uh, and when we were talking about the impact on communities, we painted a generalized picture and you're bringing us to a point where we must also start to look at how uh, some of these issues affect uh, uh, people who, uh, have, uh, who live with uh, dis disabilities. And that's an important question to, to add to the discussion. I'm going to read, um, uh, two more questions that are coming from the, the chat uh, so that we can bring them here. And the first question is from Goodwin, who says, there is a gap in the involvement of SADC uh, uh, civil society organizations in the election processes in the region, tying us back to the question of governance and why can't this be promoted? As much as these are internal issues, they impact the region as a whole, free and fair elections is the first step to peace and security in the region. Um, then the other question um, comes from, uh, I can't read the, the name there, but there's a question uh, from Mwila. Uh, okay, Mwila has already asked his question. There's one question from Anna, Anna and Anna says, uh, my question is concerning the rise and the danger of cyber crime and human trafficking, especially women and children in my country in Namibia. What are the security measures to combat the serious, uh, the serious issue? Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for those questions. I'm going to do a, my simple job of throwing them back at the panelists to respond. Uh, Boa, do you want to go first? And uh, then we can move on to Leslie, Leslie and then uh, Lizelle, Lizelle. And then we can move on to Dr. Charles. Boa? Yes, well, I think that the youth should be um, involved um, in the wider political and democratic participation of the national affairs, which means that, uh, you know, like, a country that has not uh, a policy to, to engage uh, young, its young citizens in the political uh, national affair of its country, of course, it's, um, it's, 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 it's going to fail. And um, in fact, 
And in my country, uh, to go back to Cabo Delgado, one of the reasons why, in fact, the insurgents um, gain more sort of uh, social acceptance, which we cannot deny it exists, is that they have a very big capacity of recruiting locally, right? That cannot be denied. And they have, they've been able to recruit locally because the, the, the youth have been left right unattended by the state. There is no policy to you know, support the youth. And the other thing is that you know, we need to understand that even before the insurgent uh, started, there were processes in Cabo Delgado of dispossession and expulsion of, of young people that were involved in you know, pity mine activities you know, of ruby and graffiti and stuff like that that were expelled from those activities. So they are more prone to be right, uh, at, attracted by, by the insurgents. So it's not like it's an external uh, invasion or attack uh, completely. There are very deep internal issues there. And one of those are the fact that there is no policy to sort of attend to, to young people's uh, economic needs. Uh, so I agree with Mwila Mbwanga. We need to think about the youth not only as a way to sort of you know, find palliative uh, uh, measures to satisfy them, but to think of them as um, uh, you know, in, in, in most of our countries, the biggest cate uh, social category we have. Um, uh, in terms of uh, oh, the question uh, uh, of Albert, uh, it's true. And I will again go back to Cap Delgado to say that there is um, a, a, a very uh, dangerous and very um, deep gender based violence uh, in Cap Delgado, not only uh, by the insurgent, but also. Um, uh, uh, by our state security forces, the military, uh, to, to vulnerable women, uh, disabled or no, uh, 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 I can't now specify, but there is a generalized violence against women that people take advantage of, of them, like military, military, uh, including their sort of fellow um, expelled <laughs> uh, community members uh, that take advantage of women in the camps. Uh, to abuse them and and so on and so forth. So so the issue of gender, uh, because the, this insurgency is very gendered as well in that sense, right? Um, and uh, and yeah, and if Maseko, you give me a chance to speak later, I will I would like to say what we think it should happen uh, to kind of cut the current uh, manifestation of the insurgency in Mozambique. Thanks. Yeah, sure, certainly. I'll I'll come back to you for your final words. Um, and just hold hold on to that thought. Uh, over to you, Lisa. Thank you. Yes, I mean, um, I think the focus on the youth is obviously, as we've seen across the continent, um, extremely important. Youth uh, radicalization, on the one hand, um, you know, people who we've done some studies. Um, in Somalia and in the Sahel, for example, trying to find what motivates young people to join these radical extremist groups, because, I mean, there is no denying that they are quite brutal and, you know, it's quite shocking the way that um, communities are being attacked and people are being attacked. And it's very interesting to see that very often it is linked to our livelihoods. People just simply, um, you know, as Boa has said, they were moved off their land. The fishermen were moved uh, from because of the LNG, because the ruby mines were taken over by big multinationals. So um, the answers from the people on the ground is very often that of, um, you know, they were promised a lot of money, uh, uh, income, also for protection, uh, to protect themselves and their families, sometimes they are um, um, coerced into joining these groups. It's very, very, I mean, there's a religious element and a religious extremist element, but it's very rare that that is the first driver of youth joining radical groups. It's uh, very often, you know, bread and butter issues. There is, I mean, I see one of the questions about trafficking and, and so on. And it is also a, uh, an issue you see in other places, the Sahel, for example, human trafficking. So, so, what we are so concerned about is that if you have areas like that, if you have Cabo Delgado um, uh, that continues 
to, to see this instability and conflict uh, 10 years down the line, you know, these areas are unmarginal, you know, ungoverned spaces really. And they've been drug trafficking and so, you know, precisely because it's so ungoverned. So um, the, the big concern is um, if, you know, if nothing is done, how, how is that we can't actually allow as a region to have spaces like that, because we know we've seen it elsewhere that that becomes then a hub for trafficking and um, illicit activity and, uh, and uh, you know, and apart from the fact that 700,000 people, a quarter, a third, someone had once said, I mean, Dr. Charles will know better, of the population of Carvedal Garden is actually internally displaced. They have, they've been, you know, chased out of their homes. Okay, there were the cyclones and so on, but, um, uh, you know, it's the situation is quite dramatic. So maybe just the one question. So the youth, I agree, and I mean, I don't want to comment, but there are many initiatives. The World Bank has given money, the European Union, every single embassy that you can think of in Maputo is giving money for now, you know, NGOs doing all kinds of youth development in, in Cabo Delgado. But um, is there political will to end this conflict? Um, and I'll, uh, I'll try not to be too cynical. I think that there are... Um, member states of SADC and neighbors who do have political will because they've lost a lot of money. And, you know, um, some of our heads of state don't want to, you know how the, the world works in the international community. When there was Ebola, people were saying, oh, we're not going to invest in Zambia because there's Ebola in West Africa. So the image of the continent and of the region, having um, those images from Palma, you know what I mean? That's so so uh, that's why we saw a reaction is because our politicians, um, unfortunately, uh, um, they only wake up when it, there is that threat to their economic interests and investment. They don't want to, to have uh, images like that going on CNN. So I think there is political will, but it is up against a lot of international interests. I mean, we, we haven't talked about that. You know, who really, who really has an interest also in preventing Mozambique from producing gas? You know, it's a very big global game actually, where you have all kinds of big powers who are, um, you know, uh, um, vying for, for that space. And then of course, you know, moving towards away from these gas um, uh, um, fossil fuels, although gas is seen as not as polluting as well, but anyway. Um, so I think there's political will, but um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it mm -hmm. is up against a lot of interests that are, people are definitely um, have an interest in instability in carbon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is, a, it's definitely a very complex uh, issue that requires, I think, a series of conversations for us to, to cover the, the breadth of it. Uh, Dr. Charles, would you like to take any of the questions that were asked by, by the participants? So, so certainly, certainly. And I think um, I'll, I'll just again like to paint a picture. You know, in, in a community where you have the youth that is not able to feed himself or herself or his or her family, and uh, an organization is saying, come and join me, and I will feed you and even give you extra. And that is exactly what is happening in many of these conflict prone, prone areas where they are really recruiting the youth. So what do we do? It is really in essence, how do we better engage the youth? So education, as I said earlier on, and skills development is key. Some of the youth that are in these communities that don't want to join the, the, the gangs, they flee to other communities, maybe down south or to another country. And what happens is they go there, there is no employment, criminality you know, goes up. So again, I think you know, the issue of Cabo Delgado, to be honest, it's, it's going to affect all of us in one way or the other if we don't take action. So youth engagement is absolutely key. 
and as the Red Cross Red Crescent, we're really trying as much as possible to engage them and give them skills. And um, the question about the, dif um, the, the differently abled, not the disabled, the differently abled, I think, again, that's part of our priority as the Red Cross in terms of engaging them and trying to see how best we can absorb them as part of our volunteers and workforce, but also have programs that really speak to their, you know, their disabilities. Um, so again, in Zimbabwe, please do get in touch with our Zimbabwe Red Cross colleagues, and I'm sure they can share a few, few examples and things there. In terms of CSOs in, in election processes, I fully agree. Um, how do we do that concretely? To be honest, I'm not sure, but I fully agree that in one way or the other, there needs to be that, um, that inclusivity. And child and human trafficking, I know with the South African governments, they've really done a lot in terms of border controls, in terms of documentation, in terms of what has to be done. I think maybe that could be you know, more reflected with the other countries as well. And this is where SADAC also has a big role to play in terms of just trying to ensure that you know, human trafficking is, is reduced um, throughout, throughout the, the, the sub-region. Um, but again, from my perspective, really, we all need to be in this together. Cabo Delgado can be far for some of us, but you know, if we're not careful from experience of you know, other places in, in Africa, it's gonna come, come closer to home than we expect. Thank you, Dr. Charles. Um, that point, we all need to come together. I'm going to um, assume that's your call to action and uh, give an opportunity to uh, Boa and uh, uh, Lizelle to, to also just share your last words in terms of uh, call to action. And while you do that, perhaps you can take a, a question that is coming through here from Didi Munnakotla who says that currently we are seeing that funders are redirecting funding to respond to the conflict situation with an increase in displaced people, uh, vulnerabilities in communities in, in the South like Sofala, Nampula and so forth. How can we as humanitarian actors ensure that funders still support the needs in areas not affected by the resurgence? And I think this is an important question because it ties back to what all of you have said, that the, the preconditions for conflict uh, existed before what we're seeing in, um, in, in Northern Mozambique. And if we're going to avoid conflict in, in future, we really must resolve the problems of underdevelopment and inequality that has been al uh, allowed to, to, to go out of hand in, in our region. Uh, Lizelle, uh, shall I come to you for your final words and call to action, and then I'll end with, uh, with Boa. Yes, thank you very much. And, and thank you for an interesting discussion. Um, yes, on that humanitarian um, assistance question, I, I think Dr. Charles might be better placed um, than myself, but um, it has been really very interesting to see these last couple of months how the international community actually works when there's a crisis. Uh, you know, um, how every around the globe, you know, humanitarian organizations are now mobilizing for Calvo Delgado and perhaps not, I mean, every, with, the, with the best intentions always, but um, how, what the impact of that and who coordinates. I mean, uh, there is the UN and the UN OCHA and so on. So um, I'm hoping that that coordination happens. But um, I think we must, my, my last word, I think, um, and we're so lucky to have suddenly Zoom conversations three times a day, you know, and seminars where we can actually also hear from civil society actors, you know, in small villages and so on, which we actually, it, it was possible before, but we just didn't do it. For me, um, I would say we really have to take charge, Mozambique firstly, but, and Mozambicans and the civil society, but um, we can't let um, other interests 
uh, overshadow and uh, control the responses to this crisis. I mean, it's 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 very easy to put slogans out there: African solutions for African problems. What does that really mean? What it means in this case is that um, the answers must come from from SADC, bad as it is and weak as it is, and not from the the, the multinational who control and who then come in and sit, come with their um, agendas and, um, uh, you know, requests for security responses, which uh, will not be beneficial. Um, so, yeah, so I think I would love to see the African Union get involved, um, uh, the, the, the SADC um, as well, and then give a greater voice to, to, to Mozambicans and Mozambican civil society. Thank, thank you, uh, Liesel. Uh, Boa? Yes, thank you, uh, Maseko. I think that, I mean, I, I in part agree or totally agree with uh, uh, Liesley that there, there might be some uh, unknown powers that uh, might be wanting to stop Mozambique from entering the gas and oil market. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. But also, um, if in one hand, you know, nature can no longer withstand the levels of ecological destruction caused by extractivism, whose consequences, you know, my own country uh, have suffered through cyclones. On the other hand, there are pressures coming from everywhere, forcing a, you know, paradigm change in the world, in the world economy uh, to move from fossil fuels to renew, uh, renewables. And you know the role of uh, environmental movements and activists in calling for a post-extractive uh, world or economy has been very powerful. I mean, and I will repeat what they've been saying: leave the oil in the soil, the coal in the hole, and the tar sands in the land. Um, I, I think that this should be the way to go. And in relation to this, uh, I would like to sort of briefly read some of the demands that uh, are included in the Sapsan uh, declaration or statement that we released uh, recently, which says two, total- two, two demands, uh, and then we will post the rest of the statement. Two demands. <laughs> First, total and all transnational corporations, all purchasers and all investors involved in gas extraction in Mozambique should cease all activities related to Cap Delgado gas project pending the just and acceptable resolution uh, of the legitimate grievances of communities and the Mozambican citizenry. And the second one, we, we urge SADC to limit any military intervention to a neutral SADC standby force with a clear legal mandate restricted to the purpose of uh, uh, peacekeeping and humanitarian fa uh, facilitation. So we, we, we remind of uh, abuses, abuses often recorded of peacekeepers uh, from SADC, including South African Zimbabwe. Well, thank you. Thank you for, for that. And uh, trust you to add uh, complexity right there at the end. But I think what you've done for us, which uh, would be uh, uh, possibly uh, an issue to look at as a follow-up conversation is to unpack further that um, uh, demand for a response that comes from the uh, Southern Africa People's Solidarity Network and engage around the, the demands that, are, that, that have been put forward uh, by, by uh, the citizens of, of this region. As we said at the very beginning, I think all of you have said that there needs to be a people-driven solution and we need to use this platform to bring to the fore what the demands from the people and what the demands from the ground from the ground are. I also think that something that is worth um, unpacking further is what you just said about a post uh, extractive uh, solution uh, being uh, a solution that we look at because it ties back to what we were saying earlier that what is at play is possibly energy wars and it, it, it it's it's not just about corruption, about failed governance, uh, there is layers and, and layers to it. The other thing that I think is important to unpack further and is to have a conversation that is driven by young people 
around the solutions that they would like to see and a conversation around how we address the questions of gender-based violence that have come up. Uh, in this in this discussion and listen to those who are most affected in helping us frame the discussion. I won't go any further. The experts have spoken. Our job was simply to provide a platform and uh, I would just uh, uh, make uh, an announcement or uh, start by thanking those of you who joined us on Facebook, who joined us on Twitter, who joined us on YouTube and all our other social media platforms. And to say to you, if you missed this conversation, you can catch up on all previous episodes in the Southern Africa Trust channel on SoundCloud, on SoundCloud. And uh, that in our season two of Society Talks, our plan is to bring you a topic and a dialogue every fortnight, the first Wednesday of the month and the last Wednesday of the month, same time. See you next time and thank you to, to our panelists for joining us today. Thank you. Bring in sounds of the South. Bye-bye. Choke you then you could pull Islam Wear your mask and F the system Fuck the stress, we, we keep, keep resisting Break the chains of capitalism Face to face with the cataclysm Face to face with the cataclysm Freedom, my freedom, yo, bam, 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 fuck, fuck, fuck the, the flag. flag, cross, 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 capitalism, with the people, fighting for justice, building a new world, free from domination, free from domination, free from domination. Shoes that will shoot you down. Black bodies everywhere. Bloodshed every day. Try to raise your voice, they will choke you out. 
Try to take a stand that will knock you down. So, Mr. Kutus was again again low for Sia Focus. Pilla Gentla la Cuta, Lelonia, Lipubanga Manta, the so tools. Tata Batala, Bascoba Man, the Critic Casino Mundomyam, Tala Sama, Simanga Man, the Nunia Sikama Tetumyam, Funu Lucho Radical. Mundo eating it in the Gulli was the Funu Chincho Radical. Sunga sing Ham the Bumma Nebuji when the Tim and the Bal and Command the Park as no massacre. Black bodies everywhere, blood shed every day. Try to find your keys, they will shoot you down. Try to tie your shoes, they will shoot you down. Black bodies everywhere, bloodshed every day. Try to raise your voice, they will choke you out. Try to take your stand, they will knock you down. They will knock you down. Manta! Wait, oh. Oh. Thank you so much. It's been an honor. Much love. Thank you. Thank you, thank you colleagues. Thank you. The speakers all stay, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.